This is the Story Trails podcast. Listen in as we explore India through her stories. Every side has a story to tell. His father was named the King of Kings, who built a big temple that towers over all. The son proved worthy and did many great things, though the temple he built is not quite as tall. His army and navy traveled far and wide to Maldives, Sri Lanka, and the southeastern side. The new city he built bears a name that came from his remarkable campaigns in the Gangetic Plains. Who is this king? In our previous podcast, we spoke about the great Chola king, Raja Raja the first, a mighty monarch whose authority extended over vast lands and who built the mammoth big temple in Tanjore. Could there be any king greater still than him? There was, and right under his nose, so to say, his own son, Rajendra Chola. This father-son duo stood out in an already illustrious line of kings. But just what was special about Rajendra Chola? That's the focus of today's podcast. In 985 CE, when Rajaraja became king, the Tamil country was split between three warring kingdoms, the Cheras of present-day Kerala, the Pandyas who ruled from Madurai, and the Cholas who ruled from Tanjore. Rajaraja swiftly united all three kingdoms under the Chola banner. He even annexed the northern half of Sri Lanka, But his son, Rajendra, went many steps ahead. He was leading expeditions as commander even under the rule of his father and as co-regent between 1012 and 1014 CE. He successfully captured the remaining parts of Sri Lanka and made that little island a Chola colony. He crushed revolts from the Cheras and the Pandyas. He defeated the Chalukyas and brought substantial parts of modern-day Karnataka and Andhra under his control. After that, he sent his army on a long expedition to Bengal. Now, Bengal is far away and his armies had to march through many lands to get there. And almost every kingdom on the way was subjugated by this triumphant army. It was one of the most successful military expeditions in Indian history. Of course, it added enormously to the wealth and the prestige of Rajendra Chola. Now that the borders of the Bay of Bengal was in Chola hands, Rajendra boldly decided to go across it. Did you know that the Cholas were the only dynasty to conceive of a blue water navy in the history of India? Rajendra Chola's navy was vast and very well equipped. Nearly a million sailors with hundreds of vessels spread over several naval bases in coastal Tamil Nadu and northern Sri Lanka. In 1025, he decided to attack Sri Vijaya, which consists of chunks of modern-day Indonesia and Malaysia. The Cholas defeated and captured the Sri Vijayan king, looted many prosperous Sri Vijayan ports, and returned home with even more riches. With many military successes behind him, Rajendra decided to build himself a brand new capital city. He chose a location on the banks of the Kullidam River, and a new city, Gangai Kunda Cholapuram was born. Works of ancient Tamil literature describe the city in glowing terms. The temple in Gangai Kunda Cholapuram was an architectural marvel. It remained the Chola capital for the next 250 years until the fall of the Chola Empire in 1279. Let's talk a bit more about this brilliant king and try and figure out what made him so special. Hello and welcome to the Story Trails podcast. Today we are joined by an expert who enjoys making sense of the tangled connections between art, architecture, economics, politics and geography. He has a master's degree from the prestigious London School of Economics. He has contributed over 300 articles to top-notch publications. He has authored six books and he loves history. We are delighted to have Pradeep Chakravarti as our guest on the podcast today. Welcome to this podcast, Pradeep. Thank you, Vijay. Right. So before we get into today's topic specifically, uh, let's start with a very quick primer for our listeners by talking about the Cholas. Very briefly, who were the Cholas and what makes them a great dynasty? Right. So the Cholas are a very important uh, dynasty in Tamil Nadu. 
and they are very ancient ones. So we have references to the Cholas from the Sangam literature, which is more than two thousand one hundred years old. Uh, but inscriptional concrete evidence of the Cholas we have only from about two thousand years back. Right. They started off as a very small kingdom which ruled uh, in uh, near about uh, Tirchi and Tanjavu. And they soon became very famous. And the reason they became famous was because they had one or two really great kings like Raja Raja and Raja Indra. And they built an empire which spanned not just all of South India, but a fair part of West India and Southeast Asia as well. And today we know a lot about their efficient ways of administration. Therefore, it behoves us to learn a lot about the Cholas in terms of their administration skills and in terms, of course, of the brilliant uh, pieces of architecture that are left behind for us. Right. Now, for a dynasty that lasted about three times longer than, say, the Mughals and even had overseas victories, I'm surprised that our history books have so little to say about the Cholas. Look, yeah, I mean, that's a very sad thing, isn't it? Because, I mean, and if you talk about the Cholas, it's even worse for the Cheras and the Pandyas, who are just as illustrious in different ways. Um, so I think one one thing is to keep complaining about it, and the other thing is to actually solve the problem, which is what, which is why I'm glad you're doing what you guys are doing. Um, and it is important to bring, uh, throw more light on the Cholas. Uh, and I would specifically say, if you have to look at an empire that uh, died out more than a thousand years back, even hmm. today, the eastern coast of India is called the Coromandel Coast. And that's okay. named after the Cholas. It's called a Chola Mandalam. Uh, so hmm. clearly, they've done something remarkable for their legacy to survive for such a long time. And the temples they've built, the land that they've donated to the temples, the bronzes that the uh, deities that they've donated to the temples, they're still with the temples. So in terms of longevity of fame, and I'm sure all of us want to leave a lasting legacy, Tola has really cracked it, and I, I'd be happy to talk a little bit more about what they did to make that work for them. All right. We'll come back to that question about Cholas. But before we do that, let's talk about the man who is the subject of today's discussion, Rajendra Chola. Now, we know that he took over from his father, the very well-known and very illustrious Raja Raja Chola. And we know that Rajendra Chola was also very successful in his own right. He was very successful in his military campaigns in Bengal, in Sri Lanka, in Southeast Asia. What more would you like to tell our listeners about him? How did his achievements compare with his father's achievements? Sure. So let's talk about, so let's set Rajayedra in the, in the context of time. He ruled from 1012 to 1044. Uh, and the sources that we have about his life are primarily from the hundreds of inscriptions or writing on the wall that he has left on many of the temples that he built or he renovated, including our own Gurol Thiruvotyur Adipurishwara Temple in Chennai, uh, which was completely remodeled into stone by him. Uh, and uh, we also have a lot of information about his conquest from the Trivalangada and the Karandai copper plates. Now, we know Rajendra, from, he ruled from 1012 to 1044, and uh, we know that one thing that he did right was something that he did, which his father also did, which is when the Chola king was in power, he uh, figured out large parcels of the territory to be ruled by the sons of the Chola kings, and the eldest son got a fairly large chunk, and um, he was crowned the Yuvraja as well. So for three or four successive uh, kings, the Cholas were very, very careful about avoiding succession disputes. And this is one of the big reasons why they were able to focus their military energy on, on their enemies and on their people around them, rather than focusing it on internally. Right. That clearly made a difference. I guess it gave them the leeway to focus on their arch enemies, the Cheras and the Pandyas. Now, isn't there a story of Rajendra going after the Pandya crown jewels all the way to Sri Lanka? Yes, yes, there but, is. But what were the Pandya Jews doing in Sri Lanka in the first place? Well, they were there for safekeeping, Vijay. You see, the Cholas had defeated the Pandya several times in the 10th and 11th centuries. But the one thing that eluded them were the Pandya crown jewels. Now, these jewels included a famous necklace called the Indraharam, meaning the necklace of Indra, the king of heavens. So you see, these crown jewels were considered a symbol of Pandya power. And the Cholas, well, they naturally wanted to lay their hands on them. But the Pandyas had very cleverly deposited their crown jewels with their close allies, the Sri Lankan kings. Hmm, interesting. Now, Rajendra's Sri Lankan campaign, we know, was very successful. Uh, tell us more about it, Pradeep. 
Rajendra was of course looking at ways to expand his territory, right? Because he I mean he was fighting for glory, and and more territory meant more income for his uh, army to feed his army. So he was always looking mm-hmm. at opportunities to expand, uh, much as a company would today in terms of looking at new territories for new customers. Uh, right. So the Tiruvallangad copper plates tell us that there was a horse dealer which tipped him off and said there was a lot of uh, civil war kind of confusion in the Sri Lankan territory. And he takes that as an excuse. Hmm. And I think it comes back to a lesson in history. Every time that we are divided, uh, an enemy tends to take advantage of us. I think the Sinhala kings learned that with Rajendra as well. So Rajendra comes hmm. in and um, and defeats the Sinhala kings. And it's fairly easy for him because uh, uh, two or three things. One is that like Rajaraja, Rajendra always fought from the front. Uh, he never did delegations. He was an enormous inspiration for his troops as he fought from the front. Uh, the second was the Chola army was very, very well trained. Uh, you had multiple, uh, you had multiple sections of the army, and one of the most important sections of the army was the elephant corps. And both Rajaraja and Rajendra had uh, developed this to a very high level. And elephants in a in an army can wreak havoc uh, on the enemy territory. So it's no so not surprising that the Sinhala king collapsed very quickly. And at that point of time, the Trivalangada plates give us a long list of what are the jewelry and what are the loot that Rajendra took from Sri Lanka. And here's the list. So he says the crown of the Sinhala king was taken. The Ooh. queen's crown was taken as well. The daughters of the king and the queen of the king were made captives. Uh, all the mm-hmm. royal transport was taken up. Uh, and then there was something called the garland of Indra, which must have been a, a necklace of mm-hmm. blue sapphires. And Sri Lanka was very famous for its sapphires and it continues to be. That's right. So that was taken as well. Uh, and then the Pandya crown was taken. And this was the crown that Rajasimha had left over there. Along with the Pandya crown was also a, a spectacular diamond bracelet. And an unbreakable sword. So these were taken. And this unbreakable sword must have been made out of uh, wood steel or uruk. And uh, I think many of you will know that uh, the swords that were made in Damascus and that was famous in the Ottoman Empire, the steel didn't come from that mm. region. It came actually from South India, from Bellary right mm. down to Tamil Nadu. Uh, wood steel is what they called it from the core uh, Tamil word of uruk. And then there were many, many gold images that were taken as well. And all of these was the king's property that was taken away from Sri Lanka and probably used to to, uh, to stuff the coffers of Gangikonda Cholapuram. Um, the Sinhala Chronicles, uh, which is primarily the Mahavamsa, obviously is not very fond of Raja, Rajendra. And uh, they call him and his army the blood-sucking Yaka. Yaka here is a Yaksha. A Yaksha is a is a mythological being uh, who always hoards and never gives. <laughs> I know. They must have detested Rajendra. Well, whether they liked him or not, clearly his Sri Lankan campaign was very successful. But I personally think his Bengal campaign was even more remarkable. Just imagine this man marching his huge army all the way up to Bengal a thousand years ago. Hmm. Yeah, quite quite amazing. No? And they say he went all the way just to bring back water from the Ganga River for his new capital city. So when we look at the story of Rajaraja, Rajendra bringing Ganga to the south, hmm. we have to look at it in a very metaphorical sense, right? It's not that he, can, he conquered the entire Gangetic Plain. He just hmm. touched one part of it, which is closer to where Orissa, Bihar and West Bengal is now. And it was a very ceremonial thing to do for him to look at how he could make himself uh, be seen as leaving a lasting legacy of right. going northwards as well. And uh, in fact, Tiruvallangada plate says this in a very, very, um, uh, with a lot of hyperbole. And it says, you see, hmm. Bhagiratha with all his uh, asceticism and uh, prayers and tapas, he was able to bring the Ganga when it took him a long time to do that. But our Rajendra, with just the strength of his arms, in in a matter of a few days or a few in in the matter of a few uh, months, was able to bring the Ganga back down to his region, and uh, to commemorate that is when he builds the construction of Chola Gangam Lake, which is about 130 square kilometers, which can still be seen in Ganga Konda Cholapuram. In fact, it borders Ganga Konda Cholapuram Temple, and uh, he also creates the Ganga Jalamayam Jayastambam. Which is a, which is literally like a column of victory pillar uh, 
only thing is it's not a pillar it's actually a lake and that lake has water of the ganga as well but uh, you know that said it is still quite an achievement isn't it uh, for him to have conquered uh, so many territories in gangetic plains in sri lanka in southeast asia uh, can you put it in perspective for our listeners why was this such a great achievement for those times right so i think it's it's an it's an absolutely important achievement even for today's time right you're talking about a time when technology and communications were so poor um there was constant threat of civil war right raj and and rajendra's life though some of the earlier scholars tend to make it out as if it was he was just fighting for the first 20 years of his life and the remaining time was peaceful it wasn't he was constantly at war and even if he had a lot of of his sons looking after large chunks of the territory uh, they were also not completely fond of each other so there was a little bit of fighting all the time but that being said i think you got to admire that persistence and the perseverance of that man and this very deep desire to create a lasting legacy and uh, if we then go back and look at what does it take to create a lasting legacy the cholas have clearly done it well and a couple of things that the cholas have done is one is they've, they've been very very careful about avoiding succession disputes as much as possible and i think right. that's a lesson for a lot of family owned businesses today in india many organizations don't go beyond the third or the fourth generation because of succession disputes i think the cholas managed that very well the second was they had a very strong meritoc- meritocracy system for their bureaucracy uh, the chola bureaucracy was was incredibly efficient and we have many many inscriptions from rajendra's time before and after where tax collection for example was absolutely ruthless and the third was at the end of the day rajendra was somebody who was very very focused on what he had to do which was as a king he had to ensure that they, the enemies wouldn't invade his territory and there would not be people who would question his authority with him and he was able to work right. this very very well with connecting himself to the temple and therefore bring a very emotional connect between god and king temple and palace right we will talk about that temple as well but before that let's talk about the the capital city that he built now when we speak of cholas uh, tanjore immediately comes to mind and uh, we know that it was the capital under raja raja chola uh, where does gangai konda cholapuram fit in and why did rajendra chola feel the need for a new capital city okay so that's a good question and a lot of people ask this question unfortunately the answers are only conjectural we definitely know that he was very keen on building gangekonda cholapuram and a separate temple and a separate city uh, from about 1020 because from 1023 to 1029 we see a lot of inscriptions about gangekonda cholapuram or either or set in gangekonda cholapuram um strangely mm-hmm. enough there are no rajendra inscriptions in the gangekonda cholapuram temple itself and clearly oh, rajendra yeah. wanted to finish the temple and then put all of it there so we have actually it's quite it's quite uh, amusing in a way strange, no? uh be yeah, it's very strange we don't have any inscriptions of rajendra we know that he built the temple only he built the place yeah he did but we know he did that only through his inscriptions from other temples okay. so we know for example that it was very carefully planned uh that uh, that there were at least two fortified walls the, the they must have used large burnt bricks they had buildings which had flat tile roofs uh they would have had pillars that were wood which were which had actually sockets based out of granite pillar bases and they would have been rooms which had wooden paneling uh, and many of the wooden panels would have been painted very beautifully and um they would they, he had a palace there called the chora kerala and tirumalai this much we know hmm. but what we are thankful for though is unlike rajaraja we have three literary texts which talk about uh, rajendra chola's monument one is the kalingatha barani which is an incredible uh, work that needs to be translated into english it's a war poem it's actually about a, about the orissa expedition so we have some information about rajendra over there then there is another text called the moovarulla that also has some information about rajendra but fortunately in the in a very old edition of the indian antiquary uh, which is published in about 1855 we have a long description about the archaeologists talking with a lot of horror about the remnants of a palace and the remnants of a city uh, that uh, with with a lot of bricks and stones which the locals are taking away for building their own buildings of brick and stone so there is no palace now no the palace is in complete ruins now 
and that's quite sad but at least the temple mm-hmm. still stands and it has been beautifully restored by the archaeology department right but i got to say this i mean this is an important point right when we talk about kings uh, and and both raj rajaraja's bradeshwara temple rajendra's temple in ganga konda cholapuram they're all built out of the loot of kerala and sri lanka and many other places orissa the kakatiyas mm-hmm. all of them right um mm-hmm. but in those days when kings invaded another territory and, and rajendra wreaked havoc in with the chalukya kings as well um i think what they took away as plunder and loot was very clear it was the hmm. wealth of the palace treasury the temple wealth was left untouched untouched that's right because the temple wealth was the wealth of the community hmm. and the kings were very clear about waging war with the king and not with the community perhaps that's why we see so many ancient temples in south india right let's talk about this ancient temple now pradeep would you walk our listeners through the gangai kondachuraburam temple what is noteworthy and what are the structures one must absolutely not miss when they visit right right so um definitely though it is an incomplete structure and uh, right up from the front the entrance gopura itself is uh, missing it's incomplete um there are several important things to see so the by the way the temple is set between um the uh, chola gangam lake and the vada aru hmm. and uh, the the main linga shrine the linga is about 13 feet high which is one of the largest in in india and uh, inside the temple there are many other smaller structures as well um but let's start with a few things so sri vimana or the main tower is about 160 feet which and the the bradeshwara temple is about 208 feet so if i were to do a tour of the sri vimana and, and it would be wonderful if uh, people who are listening to this can look at the photographs later the hmm. koshka sculpture so the koshkas are little recesses that you see on the walls of the sri vimana and uh, usually you would find uh, deities over there i personally feel that the uh, the koshka figures the uh, images in the ganga konda cholapuram temple are some of the finest in the chola temples uh, mm-hmm. rivaling those of the bradeshwara temple in tanjavur of particular mm-hmm. interest is the chandesa anugraha murti uh, the nataraja image is also an important one and you see a little story over there of the whole uh, of uh, uh, the dance competition between shiva and parvati the bronzes mm-hmm. are of special mention in the ganga konda cholapuram temple Now Raja Raja when he built the Bradeshwara temple he presented some fabulous bronze deities to the temple and unfortunately we've lost all of them except one Nataraja image which is fortunately in the temple fortunately we have 1000 year old bronze deities uh, donated by Rajendra Chola which is still uh, in the temple and in worship we have a Somaskanda image which is Shiva and Parvati as the mother and father in skanda or muruga as a child unfortunately the child image is missing but the soma skanda is there um like i said there are no inscriptions of rajendra chola uh, there are many inscriptions of his son and as you leave uh, i would strongly recommend to pause and admire the dwarapalakas and the uh, and the nandi as well which are also beautiful amazing thank you so much for that wonderful tour of the temple pradeep the gangai konda cholapuram palace has vanished of course uh, newer dynasties have come up they too have disappeared but the temple still stands here a thousand years later i suppose we can say proudly bearing witness to the greatest chola king ever rajendra chola absolutely the son who outdid his father <laughs> right on that note we end today's podcast thank you so much for joining us today on this podcast pradeep that was very interesting very insightful and we can't wait to start traveling again and visit some of these grand monuments and uh, you know explore it for ourselves thanks thanks for your time today my pleasure thanks a lot pradeep it was a pleasure how did you like this episode do subscribe to the story trails podcast and consider supporting us on patreon We have many more stories to tell and you will find them in our short video series blog and audio tours links on our website www.storytrails.in We'll meet you in the next episode with yet another exciting story